Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about controlling the process state. In the video on states, we learned that translating process objectives to control objectives created goals where the equipment state, what we can manipulate, is used to make the process reach and maintain a target thermodynamic state, which is what we can measure or infer from measurements. That raises a few questions. First, how do we change the thermodynamic state? By adding and subtracting energy. Next, how do we manipulate the equipment state to add and subtract energy? The answer is that what we can control are flows. Mass flows of fluids, gases and liquids, and flows of heat. Mass flows will control with pumps and valves. Heat flows will control with heat exchangers. So today we'll learn the theory and practice of how controlling mass and heat flows allow us to add and subtract energy to reach and maintain a target thermodynamic state. Let's start with fluid flows. I'm assuming you've all had a class in fluid mechanics where you learned of the many wonders of the Bernoulli equation, which is an energy balance between two points. P is pressure, rho is density, G is gravity, Z elevation, V velocity, and Q volumetric flow. W sub S is shaft work, which is how we can add energy with pumps, fans, or any kind of fluid impeller. The fancy F on the right is friction, we can increase the friction opposing fluid flow with valves that subtract energy. We use control valves to control that friction precisely. Now, the Bernoulli equation tells us that the energy we add and subtract can transform between pressure and elevation and flow rate depending on the shape of the plumbing that we're pushing the fluid through. But for a given piping network, for a given geometry, if we can control the amount of shaft work W sub S with a pump, or control part of the friction F with a control valve, we'll be able to control one pressure or one flow rate, essentially by holding everything else constant or at least dependent. Let's look at pumps. This is a pump curve, which graphs how much the pressure of a fluid passing through a pump will increase as a function of flow. What we see here is typical for a single speed centrifugal pump. Where we end up on the curve depends on whether we're pumping uphill or downhill and various sources of friction, as you know from fluid mechanics. But if the black curve represents a single speed pump adding constant energy, then these red curves are the pump curve at reduced speeds and reduced energy. A variable speed pump can be used to control a pressure or a flow by changing the amount of energy added. A single speed pump, just the black line, can't be used for control because we're not changing the energy, but it does provide the necessary energy and a relationship between pressure and flow that we can then exploit with a control valve. Control valves subtract energy through friction. As a control valve gradually closes, the friction it exerts and the energy subtracted will increase, hopefully linearly. In practice, neither pump curves nor control valves are precisely linear, but they're close enough to linear to allow us to control either flow or pressure with simple feedback controllers. When we draw a piping and instrumentation diagram for a simple feedback controller for flow or pressure, it looks like this. Here we have a single speed pump, P1, adding a constant energy with a control valve, CVP1, subtracting energy to control flow. A flow transmitter, FTP1, measures the flow and FCP1 is a feedback controller that opens and closes CVP1 to achieve a target flow rate. The diagram would be identical for pressure control, except the Fs would become Ps for the sensor and controller. Here is the alternate approach, where P1 is now a variable speed pump, which is indicated with the SCP1 tag for its speed controller. 
We can control the flow or the pressure by controlling the speed of P1 and therefore the energy added without having a control valve. Heat flow we control with heat exchangers. I hope you've learned about heat exchangers in heat transfer or design class, but the basic idea is that the process fluid we wish to manipulate is on one side, while on the other side is either a hot or cold utility fluid, most often steam or hot oil for hot, and water or air for cold. For control purposes, what is important is that the heat lost or gained by the process fluid is equal to the heat gained or lost by the utility fluid. So for a fixed process flow, changing the utility flow will change delta T process, which is what we need to control the outlet process temperature. Now the amount of heat transfer delta H depends on heat transfer coefficients, the heat exchanger area and its design, and the log mean temperature introduces some non-linearity. But as long as the difference between the process and the utility temperatures is large enough, as it will be in practice, changing the utility fluid flow will have a fairly linear effect on delta T process, and thus the exit process fluid temperature allowing feedback control of that temperature by adjusting the utility flow as diagrammed here. This is the way most heat exchangers are controlled. There is much more to learn about valves, pumps, and sensors and how to choose them, and there will be videos on these topics later in this series. Today's take-home message is that we can alter and control the equipment state, specifically pumps and valves, to manipulate fluid and heat flows, which allow us to add and subtract energy to change temperatures, flows, and pressures, and thus the thermodynamic state. Using these simple tools, we can build sophisticated control systems for complex processes. Look for a full text, exercises, and more videos at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.